Welcome back Year 11. It's been a long time since I've uh, posted a video for you. We're almost halfway through this homeostasis topic now, so I thought I'd better catch you up. So this is homeostasis part one. The internal conditions in the body must be kept constant. This stops cell damage that could happen if we didn't keep on top of things. Luckily, there are some clever systems in place to keep everything plodding along steadily. The conditions inside your body need to be kept steady even when the external environment changes. This is really important because your cells need the right conditions in order to function properly, including the right conditions for enzyme action. Homeostasis is the way in which everything is kept at the right level. Homeostasis is the regulation of the conditions inside your body and cells to maintain a stable internal environment in response to changes in both internal and external conditions. You have loads of automatic control systems in your body that regulate your internal environment. These include both nervous and hormonal chemical communication systems. The conditions in your internal environment that need regulating include body temperature, blood glucose content, water content of the body. All your automatic control systems are made up of three main components which work together to maintain a steady condition. Cells called receptors, coordination centers including the brain, spinal cord and pancreas, and effectors, muscles and glands. A change in your environment that you might need to respond to is called a stimulus. The plural is stimuli. A stimulus can be light, sound, touch, pressure, pain, a chemical, or a change in position or temperature. The receptors of an automatic control system detect a stimulus when the level of something, for example water or temperature, is too high or too low. They then send this information to the coordination center, which processes the information and organizes a response from the effectors. The effectors respond to counteract the change and bring up the level back to its optimum. The mechanism that restores the optimum level is called a negative feedback mechanism. The effector will just carry on producing the response for as long as they're stimulated by the coordination center. This might cause the opposite problem, making the level change too much away from the ideal. Luckily, receptors detect if the level becomes too different and negative feedback back starts again, so the level is kept at its optimum. This process happens without you thinking about it. It's all automatic. An example is body temperature, which is usually kept within half a degree Celsius above or below 37 degrees. If the temperature receptors detect the temperature is too high, an effectors respond to decrease the temperature. This usually is in the form of you sweating. Temperature receptors detect that the temperature gets too low, then effectors respond to increase the temperature. This can be shivering or pulling the hairs up on your arms so they trap a layer of air. Your internal environment overall will stay around about the optimum level. Next up, an overview of the nervous system. Organisms need to respond to stimuli in order to survive. A single-celled organism can just respond to its environment, but the cells of a multicellular organism need to communicate with each other first. So as multicellular organisms evolved, they developed nervous and hormonal communication systems. Your nervous system is what allows you to react to your surroundings. It also allows you to coordinate your behavior. It's made up of all the neurons, nerve cells in your body. There's more about these coming up. Receptors are the cells that detect stimuli. There are many different types of receptors, such as taste receptors on the tongue, sound receptors in your ears, smell receptors in your nose, and light receptors in your eyes. Receptors can form part of larger, complex organs. For example, the retina of the eye is covered in light receptors. The central nervous system is where all the information from the receptor is sent and where reflexes and actions are coordinated. In vertebrates, animals with backbones, this consists of the brain and the spinal cord only. In mammals, the central nervous system is connected to the body by sensory neurons and motor neurons. 
Neurons transmit information as electrical impulses to and from the central nervous system. This happens very quickly. Instructions from the central nervous system are sent along neurons to effectors. Effectors are muscles or glands which respond to nervous impulses and bring about a response to a stimulus. Muscles and glands respond to nervous impulses in different ways. Muscles contract. Glands secrete chemical substances called hormones. Different types of neurons are involved in the transfer of information to and from the central nervous system. Sensory neurons are neurons that carry information as electrical impulses from the receptors in the sense organ to the central nervous system. Relay neurons are the neurons that carry electrical impulses from sensory neurons to motor neurons. They are found in the central nervous system. Motor neurons are the neurons that carry electrical impulses from the central nervous system to the effectors. The transmission of information to and from the central nervous system is summarised in this flowchart at the bottom. You should remember from the C1 topic where we looked at specialised cells, some features of nerve cells. They're extremely long cells. They have many branches at both ends so they can connect to other nerve cells. They can make many connections. The long axis, which is the main branch, is covered in fat to prevent the electrical impulses um, leaving the, the nerve cells. It's called the myelin sheath. The central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system are adapted as well. They have separate parts for separate jobs. So the central nervous system is coordination, whereas the peripheral nervous system gathers the information and um, transfers a the message back to the effectors. The peripheral nervous system connects to all parts of the body so that the messages can be sent anywhere it needs to be. There are three different types of nerve cells with three different jobs as well. This makes the system more efficient. We looked at these in class. The sensory nerve cell, which gathers the information from the senses. The relay nerves, which um, are in the central nervous system and pass the message on and the motor neurons which go back to the effectors and cause some sort of reaction to happen. Reflexes are rapid responses to stimulus that happen without you having to think about them. They're automatic. The neurons involved in reflexes aren't all joined together though. They have gaps between them called synapses. The connection between two neurons is called a synapse and the nerve signal is transferred by chemicals which diffuse across the gap. These chemicals then set off a new electrical signal in the next neuron. Neurons deliver information really quickly because the signal is transmitted by electrical impulses. Synapses slow down the transmission of a nervous impulse because the diffusion of chemicals across the gap takes time. Still pretty fast though. Reflexes are fast, automatic responses to certain stimuli. They bypass your conscious brain completely. When a quick response is essential, your body just gets on with things. Reflexes can reduce your chances of being injured, although they have other roles as well. If someone shines a bright light in your eyes, your pupils automatically get smaller. This means that less light gets into your eyes, which stops them getting damaged. Adrenaline is a hormone which gets your body ready for action. If you get a shock, your body releases adrenaline automatically. It doesn't wait for you to decide that you're shocked. The knee-jerk reflex helps maintain posture and balance. Doctors test this reflex by tapping just below the knee with a small hammer. This stimulates pressure receptors, making the muscle in the upper leg contract, which causes the lower leg to rise up. The passage of information in a reflex from receptor to effector is called a reflex arc. The neurons in a reflex arc go through the spinal cord or through an unconscious part of the brain. Here are the main stages in a reflex arc. When a stimulus is detected by receptors, impulses are sent along a sensory neuron to a relay neuron in the central nervous system. When the impulse reaches a synapse between the sensory neuron and the relay neuron, they trigger chemicals to be released. These chemicals cause impulses to be sent along the relay neuron. 
When the impulse reaches a synapse between the relay neuron and a motor neuron, the same thing happens. Chemicals are released and cause impulses to be sent along the motor neuron. The impulse then travels along the motor neuron to the effector, which is usually a muscle. If the effector is a muscle, it will respond to the impulse by contracting. If it's a gland, it will secrete a hormone. Because you don't have to think about the response, which takes time, a reflex is quicker than a normal response. This diagram summarises a reflex arc. If a bee stings a person, the reflex response is that the hand moves away from the source of pain. Here is the pathway taken by the reflex arc. The cheeky bee stings the finger. Stimulation of the pain receptor causes an impulse to travel along the sensory neuron. The impulses are passed along a relay neuron via a synapse, and then the impulse travels along a motor neuron via another synapse. When the impulse reaches the muscle, it contracts, and the hand moves away from the source of pain. The required practical in this topic was about investigating reaction time. The time taken to react to a stimulus depends on how quickly the message travels from the receptor to the effector via the central nervous system. This is called the reaction time, and it varies from person to person. Reaction time is the time it takes to respond to a stimulus. It is often less than a second. It can be affected by factors such as age, gender, and drugs. You need to know how to investigate the effect of a factor on a person's reaction time. Caffeine is a drug that can speed up a person's reaction time. The effect of caffeine on reaction time can be measured. You'll need another person for this experiment. This is the person whose reaction time will be tested. You will provide the stimulus. Here's what we did. The person being tested should sit with their arm resting on the edge of a table. This should stop them moving their arm up or down during the test. Hold a ruler vertically between their thumb and forefinger. Make sure that the zero end of the ruler is level with their thumb and finger. Then let go without giving any warning. The person being tested should try and catch the ruler as quickly as they can, as soon as they see it fall. Reaction time is measured by the number on the ruler where it's caught, at the top of the thumb. The further down it's caught, i.e. the higher the number, the slower their reaction time. Repeat the test several times and calculate the mean distance that the ruler fell. The person being tested should then have a caffeinated drink, for example a glass of Coca-Cola and after 10 minutes, repeat the test. When we carried out this investigation, we needed to control any variables that weren't being changed to make sure it was a fair test. These included things like the same person catching the ruler each time, the person always using the same hand to catch the ruler, we used the weaker hand. The ruler should always be dropped from the same height, and you should make sure that the person being tested has not had any caffeine or anything else that might affect their reaction time before the start of the experiment. Testing reaction time seems simple enough, but there are still some important safety points you need to think about for this experiment. For example, any drinks need to be consumed outside of the lab, away from any chemicals or other hazards. Also, too much caffeine can cause unpleasant side effects, so the person being tested should avoid drinking any more caffeine for the rest of the day after the experiment is completed. Simple computer tests can also be used to measure reaction time. An example would be a person being asked to click a mouse or press a key as soon as they see a stimulus on the screen, like a box changing colour. Computers can give more precise reaction times because they remove the possibility of human error from the measurement. As the computer can record the reaction time in milliseconds, it can also give a more accurate measurement. Using a computer can also remove the possibility that the person can predict when to respond. Using the ruler test, the catcher may learn to anticipate the drop by reading the tester's body language. This is the midpoint of this homeostasis topic. We've obviously got a break for your trial exams, so we need to take that into consideration. You need to keep up revising these topics as well as your topics from year 10. So good luck in the trials. I'll post the second half of this topic after the trial exams are finished.